Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here tonight. The first point I'd like to talk about tonight is substance. In Zen, it's very easy to get to substance because it is very directly pointed out in our teaching. When we attain this point, when you hear just the sound, there is no thinking. That point of no thinking is becoming one. The self, with all its dualities, is extinguished. And that moment, we attain realization. You all know what this stands for. It has no name, no form, no life, no death, no coming, no going. Yet we call this something in order that we could communicate about that. If we call it substance, it's not good, not bad. But it's like labeling a jar with a wonderful word. And sometimes in our intellectual folly, we disregard its contents. And that's why in Zen, we put so much effort and emphasis on practicing. Just like tonight, we spoke very few words and we sat in meditation in silence most of the time. If we attain our true substance, our true nature, our mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. And then the second important point in Zen is realized. We call that truth. In this mirror, the truth is reflected as it is. We see clearly, we hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, and feel clearly. That clarity does not come without attaining our substance, our true nature. This is why it's so important. But if we attach to substance, we can become attached to emptiness. Then we do not perceive the truth because we lose our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So perceiving the truth clearly is very important because without that, we cannot be human beings. It's impossible to live on this planet. It's impossible to recognize each other as we are and see this world as it is. And this quality of thusness or as we are is in the Buddha's teaching. It's called Tathata or Bhuta Tathata in Sanskrit. And if we attain the truth, we attain the suchness or thusness of this world without thinking just like this. And if we attain substance and truth, then the third point is function. How do we function correctly as human beings? What is my job in this life? Why was I born? What am I supposed to do with those few decades that I have? How am I supposed to help this world? And in terms of function, we have wisdom and compassion built in. By way of our practice, these two qualities naturally and spontaneously appear. So when somebody is happy, you're happy with that person together. We call that subject just like this. What you do, I do. What you feel, I feel. It's expressing and experiencing oneness in our function, in our together action. But there is what we call object just like this. When somebody is hungry, give that person food. Somebody is thirsty, give that person drink. That's when we see suffering and we alleviate suffering. Through our compassion, we also attain suffering. But if we only suffer together with all beings and do not make one more step, we cannot alleviate that and cannot bring them closer to enlightenment. Ultimately, the Dharma is very simple. We believe that the Dharma may be in, in these words, in these books, the sutras, the patriarchal lineages of various traditions. And this is true in terms of expression, the word, cognition, the thought. However, true Dharma is unwritten. It's in our hearts. It's in the song of the birds, the way the trees grow in a forest. Cause and effect becomes an intellectual layer of knowledge in our minds because we are clever beings as humans. 
But the path to awakening is open. As an old poem said, without cultivation, you are already complete. And when we cut off all thinking and return to the mind before any dualities, as we say to don't know mind, then we can realize this. The Dharma without words cause and effect as it operates spontaneously without human thinking. How far do we go on this path? How much courage do we have to follow this? If we ask the great question, what is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, feels with my heart and thinks with the mind, we can attain our true self. It is not even the question of what am I, it is really the question, what is this? Without projecting any self, without making any idea. And whether we sit, stand, walk, or lie down, whether we are speaking in silence, being awake or in a dream, constantly, without interruption, what is this? Keep the great question, because the question opens the mind. The question can completely open the mind if you can let go of the words of the question after a while until only the question itself remains. And if you have great courage next to the great question, then you develop great faith. This great faith is not dogmatic. It's not based on somebody's idea, history, organized religion, whatever we want as support for our own doubts, for our own weaknesses. These three together can give us back our spiritual autonomy, the realization of our true nature or Buddha nature in Zen. And interestingly enough, only those people who realize this spiritual autonomy and wake up to ourselves, we can cooperate. Those who do not attain this autonomy will always depend on something, someone, some idea. And that means that we cannot cooperate fully. We are lacking something. 2,500 years ago, Buddha Shakyamuni started his teaching with the Lotus Sutra. The Four Noble Truths, the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering were clearly laid out. And for the first 10, 15 years of his teaching, he spoke mainly about that. And very soon after he laid the groundwork for this, he started to teach what is later known as the Heart Sutra, the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. And as we recited the Heart Sutra today, it became apparent again that originally there is no suffering. Originally, there is no cause of it. Originally, there is no end to it and no path to attain it. So how come that there is a great teacher who was teaching about 49 years in his lifetime, and he speaks about the Four Noble Truths? And a few decades later, the transcendence of the Four Noble Truths bring us to the Heart Sutra. Did he reverse on his teaching? Was something wrong at first? No, there was something very important that the students did not understand at first because it was too simple and all in one step, you cannot go from zero to 100%. And that teaching later became known in the, in the Avatamsaka Sutra. If you want to understand the nature of this world, then perceive it as created by mind alone. So if we create suffering, we have it then obviously there's some cause to it. Then we have to find the end of it and walk on the path to end it. And the good news that has been circulating on this earth for the last 2,500 years, that it is not necessary to live in suffering. If we make it, we have it. If we don't make it, we don't have it. And a thousand years after Buddha, Bodhidharma brought that message home very clearly as he went from India to China. And to finish my brief introductory, let me juxtapose the four principles of Zen to the Four Noble Truths. And you see the transition 
that happened in 1,000 years about 560 BC to about 550 AD. Between Buddha and Bodhidharma, tens of millions of Buddhists appeared. Thousands of monasteries were constructed and hundreds of thousands of monks and nuns devoted their lives to practice and teach the Dharma. And as you may all know, the four principles of Zen will really get the current Buddhist society out of their own comfort zone. And it says, do not depend on the scriptures. Directly point to human mind. Awakening means you attain your true nature, thus become Buddha. And the transmission can only happen from mind to mind. These four principles are the cornerstones of our Zen practice. And yes, we do read and understand the sutras, but we do not depend on them. We respect the patriarchal lineage, but we are making every possible effort to realize what they have realized. We don't follow persons and people. We follow the path that respected teachers have followed and have shown us. So it is my true honor and privilege to have spoken before you tonight. And I'm kindly waiting for any questions that you may have in this regard. Thank you. You come to us at an interesting time as our teacher is just retired. And she's prepared us as best she can to act on our own as a sangha and to, to learn from one another and to teach ourselves. Do you have any comments, thoughts, words of wisdom as how, how a sangha can function that way? First of all, although I haven't met your teacher, let me express my gratitude and respect towards her. Because obviously the sangha is together. Uh, you are practicing true dharma. And this is wonderful and rare in this world. Second of all, just like in Shakyamuni Buddha's time, there is a lineage of teachers. And the Sangha develops naturally a hierarchy among the members, which is not rigid, which is not just some human being's opinion, but it reflects our seniority, our uh, practice, our experience, and most of all, our ability to help one another. I am sure you are aware of the legacy of your teacher. And I'm also sure that she appointed maybe one, maybe more successors to continue her job. And if not, then you should ask that this would happen and that somehow the succession line would be clear. There are teachers, Zen masters in the history of uh, Buddhism who retired or passed away without a Dharma heir. That's not good, not bad. But then the Sangha starts from scratch and means practice starts again, together. Finding a teacher starts again. Because there is no appointed lineage, which I believe is very important. Buddha Shakyamuni himself appointed Mahakashyapa. He was the first patriarch. All of you probably know the flower sermon. And that is the core of Zen transmission. For those of you who may not have heard it, let me briefly recap that. One day, on Vajra Peak, Buddha Shakyamuni was sitting before beginning his teaching. And he was silent for quite some time. And the Sangha could not make any sense of it. But when Mahakashyapa appeared, he came and he sat down. Then the Buddha raised the flower. Nobody understood. Only Mahakashyapa smiled. And then the Buddha spoke. Now I transmit my true dharma to you. In some accounts, it's much lengthier and more ornate, but this is the basic meaning. So why did Mahakashyapa smile? What is the true meaning of the Buddha transmitting his dharma to him? And of course, there was Ananda and later on many other patriarchs until Bodhidharma the 28th took the lineage to China. So I believe that appointing the next teacher is important. And it keeps the health and functionality of the Sangha very well. And I hope this has happened here. And then just make the next step, practice more together, 
attract more meditators naturally. And then the Sangha lives on and transmits the Dharma to more and more beings. More questions? In times of darkness, like now, how do we focus on remaining open, remaining hopeful, continuing on into the future? Define darkness for me. Certainly, you don't think I'm at a lack of photons in a room, right? No. Great. The global philosophies and the global darkness that seems to be spreading in so many different continents. Global philosophies, as far as we can go back, at least in Europe, yeah, starting with the Greek and then the Roman and the medieval philosophies, they were pretty harmless until some minds created a strong identity out of it. They became attached to it, they identified with it, and strangely enough, that identification produced a lot of greed and anger, because at the root of it, there was ignorance. And when we dispel ignorance, then greed and anger do not appear. Reverse the equation. If greed and anger is prevalent, let's say these are the two main components of the darkness we are talking about, then there is some ignorance and false identification at the root of it. And in Zen, we do not prune the tree just by the leaves. We go to the root. And that's why true Dharma never goes political. It stays human and at the very, very bottom of our hearts to dispel our own ignorance so that we do not produce any darkness, no greed, no anger. And that has some effect even on your neighbor. Your neighbor may ask, how come you're so peaceful? Aren't you outraged? Dot, 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 dot. And you can say, outrage is a luxury. I can't afford it. Instead, I try and realize my true situation, which is our true situation, one by one. We establish correct relationship, and then we function together. We cooperate. So take away ignorance, take away avidya, then these strong dualistic appearances of greed and anger also disappear. And you may say, oh yeah, wishful thinking, look at the last 2,500 years. The problem is that we produce on a global scale, as 7.8 billion human beings, this ignorance, greed, and anger much faster than we could produce enlightened society. Yet, we have to try. I'm from Europe. We have a rich history of failed revolutions, thwarted ideologies, communism and capitalism fighting, thousand years of the dark ages after the Roman Empire collapsed, before Renaissance appeared. In 1600 AD, Galileo had to rescind his teaching because he was under pressure. He feared for his life. So take away ignorance and take it away first from our own hearts and help each other do the same. And then these philosophies, as you say, or just ignorant views, they cannot take hold in the human heart. People won't identify with it. They will see that they are just like dark clouds. They appear, sometimes they give rain and thunder and sometimes hurricanes, and then they disappear. But if we have any dualistic relationship to them, then we become part of it. We are controlled by other people's mistakes. Our opinions become attachments. Attachments become identification. And before we know it, we are in the same realm, the same suffering, painful, hellish, dark realm where we want to get out of. Many people cannot change where they live because they can't move. They have to continue their work. They have their families, friends, house, mortgage, cars, everything in one place. But you can move inside. You can change inside. And that's why this practice and other sanghas are of the utmost importance. Because we change ourselves, we change the world. The way out is actually the way in. If I saw any alternative, I would tell you. I'd just like to follow up on what you just said to this gentleman here. When you said, the way out is the way in. Would you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, first of all, 
this way in is, as I mentioned earlier, is asking the right question inside and finding the solution inside the mind. And when we have solved our own problems, when we dispelled our own ignorance, when we developed the sufficient qualities that we would be human beings, then the solution appears outside. My favorite example is the French Revolution. I screamed. 1789, it started. 1815, with Napoleon's demise, it stopped. And during this generation, because 25, 30 years is a generation. France and the surrounding countries, even up to Egypt where Napoleon went, experienced all the possible ignorance, greed, and anger that can come from very, very bad philosophies, very strong identifications, huge amount of suffering appeared, and one monarch got dethroned. Following 25 years, millions of people died. And then another monarch took the throne under a different name from a different house. It made no sense at all. They were looking for changing the world instead of changing themselves. So the way out of suffering is actually going deeper and deeper inside. And how do you do that? Same thing as we are doing here tonight. No magic. There is no magic to it. We just have to do it. The bows, the chants, the sitting, these forms have function. But I think you already understood that. You already understood how to do this. Are you a Korean Zen Buddhist? I followed, That's what I heard. Yeah. Formally, I followed that tradition because my late teacher, Zen Master Sung San, was from Korean Zen tradition. So in terms of formal identity, yes. I am in that tradition. But our true self is not Buddhist or Christian. Are you familiar with the Hua Hien teaching? Uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra, they're based in Hua Umsa, south part of South Korea. I met a few students from there, but I'm not familiar with the teaching. And what is the primary practice for Korean Zen practitioners? In Soto Zen tradition, which I'm a part of, we do Zazen. Is that also the practice of Korean Zen Buddhists? Yes. Zazen and chanting and bowing. Chanting all the three bowing. forms. Yes. That's in terms of the practice as a method. But we also use kongans. We use kongans in Japanese koans. Koans. Yeah. Which, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, more significant in the Rinzai lineage than the Soto. Yes. But uh, our great teacher, Zen Master Sung San, incorporated that, in fact, created a very, very suitable Kongan practice system for the Westerners and, of course, for the Asians alike. And I found that very attractive for the students because it gives them good teaching and good inspiration and good progress. This is personal. I'm curious about how you became interested in practicing Zen. I became interested because I really didn't know who I was. Until my mid-twenties, I tried many kinds of arts and sports and martial arts and oriental paths. And I understood a few things, but not really deep enough. And my question, which led me to Zen, was this. We are all playing our part in life. It's like actors on stage. So now, my temporary job here tonight, I act as a teacher. But when I traveled on Delta Airlines a few hours ago, I was a passenger. I was not a teacher. Even earlier, in Sarasota, Florida, when I had breakfast with my good Dharma friend and host, I was a co-practitioner because I sat together with him half an hour in the morning. So already three roles today. And as we go through our lives, we have socially conditioned roles. We are children first. We can't change that. Then we are adolescents and then grown-ups. And then if you marry, you're a housewife or a husband. If you produce children, you become a mother or a father. These are all roles that we play in this worldwide stage. 
who is the director. I wanted to find the director so bad that I cleared the stage. No roles. I'm done. I practiced. I became monk. I spent six years in South Korea and then returned uh, following my teacher's instructions. And one hint, the director never appears on the stage. Only the actor or the actress. But if we don't attain the director inside, we cannot control our own part of the stage. We cannot control the roles that we play. We just follow causes and conditions and expectations and fear and hope and all that. We can do better. We should do better. More questions? Would you please speak about attachment, non-attachment, detachment, th that issue? And I'm not struggling so much with possessions and ideas as relationships, important relationships. How do you negotiate? Okay. Grab this stick, please. Now you have it. Huh? All right. Can you give it back to me? Thank you. That's how we let go. We have to start with easy things. Relationship training is a little bit more complex. Level two. Grab the stick again, please. Yes. <laughs> you were sitting on a chair. My weight point was lower than yours. I could dislodge you. It was just a situation. It doesn't mean I'm, in fact, you're very strong. You could pull this very hard. <laughs> Wonderful. So if you change your own position in a relationship, then your own vulnerability also changes. How does a relationship begin? I asked you to grab the end of the stick, you did. We entered into a kind of zen stick relationship, okay? <laughs> I asked you to let go. Then the relationship stopped. I have this only in my hand. So the relationship is my idea because you're not part of it. So it's not just an English idiom that it takes two to make a tangle. It is really true that it takes two to form a relationship. So see how you contribute to that. We have four major channels. Thinking, feelings, speech, and action. And of course, all the sensory channels that are pretty easy to identify. What kind of speech, what kind of thinking, what kind of emotions, and what kind of actions do you put into the relationship? That's your part. And of course, you have the other being right in front of you, next to you, relating, reacting to that. It's like mirror to mirror, action, reaction, stimulus, response. And if you want to change the relationship, you have to change the inputs on these four channels. And as long as there is back and forth, me and you, action and reaction, there is relationship. If you empty all the four channels, no more speech, no more emotions, no more actions, no more thinking, and no more lawyers, then the relationship ends. But as long as you keep the four channels running, there is a relationship. So the teaching on emptiness is very useful. If the Heart Sutra checks out and no, 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 then it's over. But if just one pilot light is on, then the whole thing can go on fire again, even after many weeks, months, or years. So how do we start things? How do we end things? The Heart Sutra clearly says things have no beginning and no end. We make that. I think True relationship begins when we stop blaming the other, when we really see what we put into the relationship and want to change ourselves in it rather than pointing the finger at the other. You are like this, 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 this. Yeah, maybe, but it's my filters that say so. The dog around the corner doesn't have the same relationship problem with that person as I do. Neither the bird in the forest or the deer on the driveway. I have my filters, my mind, my problems. I change that, relationship also changes. And ultimately, the question is how do we transform the relationship into something we call bodhisattva path. And immediately, 
this selfish expectation which usually both parties have in a relationship, it changes to this question, how may I help you? Your happiness comes before mine. And if it's mutual, it can be the best thing in the world, the best thing that ever happened to you. But these things do not just happen. We make them. We make them. So if the mind is clear, relationship is also clear. Mind is not clear, relationship is not clear. Reverse the equation. If you experience unclarity, unresolved problems, etc., first ask, where is my mistake? And this is not a guilt trip. This is discovering cause and effect. If you discover cause and effect, you see how it operates. You enter the Dharma, the personal Dharma, the relationship Dharma itself. Okay? I find myself in an unusual position in my life where, as a result of Zazen practice, among other things, I feel like I have a stronger intuitive sense of how desire and attachment lead to suffering. But in terms of the practicalities of my own life and in terms of the circumstances I'm presented with as a citizen of the United States and of the planet, there's all these daunting challenges, all these intense aspirations that I feel like I have to live up, live up to. In the scope of my own life, I'm looking for full-time employment, and that doesn't seem especially optional. And the obstacles to that are pretty intense, given my history and given my age group, among other things. And I'm also volunteering for a climate activist organization, and that doesn't seem especially optional either. And there's no upper limit to how much I can do for a climate activist organization. So given that desire can be a powerful motivator, and given that there's worthwhile things to be intensely desired, how can I reconcile that with the Buddhist teaching that desire causes suffering? Very well. Think about desire as energy that we all have. In fact, we all need. Like, if your desire engine stopped inside, you wouldn't feel hungry. You would die of starvation because the engine is turned off. I believe when you look at the function of desire, there's a level when it becomes obsession. And watch that. Do not let healthy desires of helping the planet, having a nice family, having a full-time job, these are all desires, but they're not good, not bad because you can help others through this energy. It's possible. But when it becomes obsession, then it's selfish. And it's just about you. My job, my car, my, 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 my. So the moment that this energy gets selfish becomes very destructive. Like saying no is not anger. But when it becomes obsessive, defensive behavior, then saying no actually became something else. We have to know our own limits, our own borders, and we have to establish them towards others. When we say no to someone, it doesn't mean we are angry at them. So look at the self or your self-image, how it operates. And if you help all beings by satisfying your desires, and it's not just personal, then you're on the path. The moment it becomes selfish, obsessive, compulsive, defensive, then the hurricane begins. So what do you do when it feels as though the cultivation of desire is necessary? When you feel as though the thing that you're pursuing is worthwhile, and so it feels necessary to stoke more and more desire in order to live up to the demands of that thing? Like well, now, desire sounds like an abstraction, because when you pursue some goal, then you put effort in it in the same channel as a relationship. You talk about it, you have feelings about it, you act in order to realize it, you speak about it with others. So see what it does. See the direction where that energy goes. See the cause and effect relationship. Okay? I visited Hong Kong in the 90s before it went back to China. There was a Buddhist man during the Dharma talk, and he was the president of the Lions Club there, having eight very large restaurants as just one of his ventures. And he asked the Sun Sun Zen master, Sun Sanim, I have eight restaurants and I make a lot of money. Is that bad? And he said, not good, not bad. What do you do with the profit? That's the question. 
you can realize your ambition, your desire, your goals. What do you do with the profit, with the result? Okay? In our genre, Zen practice, if you realize something, then right away there is this imperative to help all beings. So wake up and save all beings from suffering is the original imperative from the Buddha's time. So no one can possibly keep any attainment for themselves because that themselves originally does not exist. So once you realized that, and there's a degree of awakening in your life, it's impossible that that wouldn't have an effect on your surroundings, your relationships, the person next to you on the bus, without you saying a word, let me emphasize. So share it. Use it to help other beings. And then this energy can get recycled in a most positive way. And this is not about activism. That's a special way of doing that. It's about being just a normal, clear, ordinary human being with the necessary qualities of wisdom, compassion, and selfless action. That's all. You see cause and effect. You see the direction. You can make good decisions. OK? More questions? My understanding is in the Korean tradition, uh, chanting is used as a practice than, than we do here, at least. Well, could you say something about chanting for me, please? In the context of the three practices that I mentioned, bowing is like breaking ice. I mean, ice is melting anyway, but suppose you have a big, big and thick ice field, a crust. That's your karma. Then you bow is the icebreaker. When you chant, it's like boiling the icy water, bringing it up to the boiling point. And sitting is like a nice wind that blows the clouds away. And we realize that, uh, at least in the monastic path, if you don't bow and you don't chant, your sitting is terrible. You see some of the worst movies in your mind because you just haven't cleaned them out. And when you bow, it's really like breaking the ice of the karma. When you chant, it's deep cleaning of your entire subconscious region, everything. So if people have a hard time sitting, they should chant more and bow more. With the mantras uh, and sutra recitals, I see three functions. One is establishing a clear internal hierarchy within yourself. And on the top of the totem pole is the meaning or the purpose of the mantra. So the mantra's meaning is wake up, get enlightenment. When you recite that, it becomes the most important part of your mind. Because that's the wolf that you feed. You give less food to other parts. The second is decreasing the noise. We all have mind chatter. The smarter you are, the more elaborate this mind chatter is. The more you believe your own narrative. And mantra reduces this noise. And you really can perceive the grasshoppers, the sounds, the space, the environment, people around you. Also your own mind content. And the third and for me the most important part is preventing harmful influences in the mind. Our reactionary mind, our reactive consciousness can be your best friend or your worst enemy, depending on what kind of karma there is in it. And before you believe your own reaction, before you subscribe to your next dualistic newsletter, the mantra can actually establish a firewall. So the signal comes through, but the reactions do not stick into your identity layer. So these three functions of the mantra are irreplaceable. I don't think there's any other way to make that happen. So clear spiritual hierarchy in the mind, reducing the noise so that you would perceive the signal and protecting the mind from its own harmful influence, harmful, reactionary, dualistic ideas that we believe. That, that's when you are so right, and you are the only one who is right, and everybody else is wrong. That's when it happened. And it happens in a nanosecond, because this thing is the fastest supercomputer on Earth, and you have it, every one of you, in your cortex, okay? It's fine, but if you can't find a switch, then this computer controls you. And mantra practice is a very nice reboot for the whole thing. So short mantra, long mantra, sutra recital, doesn't matter. Do it every day. Then these effects, they surface.
Thank you so much for coming. It's a special treat. It really is for us. I'm really enjoying this. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I'm a householder. I sit 20 minutes a day, m most days. Some days I don't. I'm listening to what you just said. I'm not sure what my question is. I just, what advice can you get? My house, <laughs> I have two, I have young children. You know, I have a super busy life. I, you know, I have a full-time job and I suffer, you know, every day. And that's why I'm here. That's why, that's why Zen spoke to me. What advice can you give um, for, I guess, us householders? Because I want to deepen, I mean, I, I, I was listening to what you just said about chanting, and bowing, and I don't do that much at home. I'm just, I'm up in my head all the time, you know, it's just constant spinning, and um, I feel confused a lot. So first order of business is come down to your Tantian or Tanden in Chinese and Japanese, okay? Because when you come to the navel chakra, and that's why we focus with the Mahamudra here, and not here, not here, not here, here. Because that's the stress relief point. That's where your energy is still one and not differentiated into various functions. So the basic house cleaning is leave this upper three major centers and the sensory organs alone. Let them just kind of empty out. When you come back to the Tantian or Tanden, you focus your energy there. This is your internal refuge. So any shock, any suffering, anything out of the ordinary that wants to really break you, shake you, detach from that and come back to your Tantian. That's number one. Otherwise, these upper centers can get damaged, okay? It's not necessary. It's not anybody's fate or destiny. Next, do some chanting, really, because chanting is really like oil to the wounds inside. I was very happy to see the Kanze and Bosatsu mantra in the chanting book, which I encountered 10 years ago in Shodo Harada Roshi's Sangha in Hungary. And I practiced with them. Kanze, Onnamu, Butsu, Butsu, Inyo, Butsu, and it's all there, okay? This has a beautiful translation beneath that. And when I asked the master, he didn't quote literally line by line, he said, we vow not to become separate from the original mind of Kwan Seon Bosa or Kwan Seon Bosatsu. That's it. So that means basic compassion mantra. And to alleviate this suffering, especially this cognitive, super precise, one by one, conceptual, mathematical, everything up here, you need compassion. It's like flushing everything out in the right way. So recite that mantra many times. Just put it on loop. Okay? And the focus should be here. Don't lose your breath. So your breath is primary focus, and right next to it is the mantra. Very important. If you don't have your breath, you lose your mind space. You lose your buffer zone. Then your mantra and your karma, they play accident. They crash. It's not necessary. And then the third is asking the right question. We talked about the great question today. What is this? It's a subject-oriented question because it is directed to the source of the question. Basic, very important. But then you can have an object-oriented question, provided that your mind is clear enough to reflect, and your mind, your cognition, doesn't kick in. Okay? That's why these preliminary exercises are very necessary. But then you put your problem, the actual burning problem, right in front of you, and you say, what is this? Where does this come from? And if you learned to subdue your dualistic thinking and keep your mind clear like a mirror, then the fact is like the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle falling into place one by one, and you don't touch it. It becomes complete by itself. Because your own self, your own dualistic thinking and emotions stayed out. They don't touch the problem. So the problem reveals its cause and effect what it feeds on and what it provides. And sometimes it's shocking what happens within a family, what kind of energies there are, 
what is the real relationship, not what we pretend towards each other, but what is actually there between us. So these three things, Tanjung practice, mantra for cleanser and strengthening the mind, and asking an object-oriented question and keeping the mind before thinking in a non-dualistic, clear mirror state. You do this, things begin to change. How soon depends on you. Attached to old ideas, fear of the new, very slowly. Ready to change, ready to see, quicker. Let go of all ideas, all attachments, right now. That's why Zen is not a quick fix, it's not a promise. We call it expedient means. Depends on you, your usage, how effective that is. It's usually the best before the kids wake up, okay? Take that one hour, and by the time they wake up, you're in position, you're stronger, clearer, ready to rock and roll, and then it works. I want to sincerely appreciate your attention tonight, your openness uh, to invite me here, and I hope that in the future we can share the Dharma and practice together and uh, save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.